Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, thanks for joining. I was just asking if you want to write down in the chat where you are um, located. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes till um, more people join the um, webinar. So we have region three representation. I'm in South Carolina. Um, Dr. Lenardi is in North Carolina. And then Charlene said she's in Jamaica. Thanks, Sarah, for um, joining from Cary, North Carolina. And I know um, Anne Kumsulanski, she is also uh, from Georgia. So Kathleen from Atlanta, Georgia. Yes. Jeremy, hello from Raleigh, North Carolina. I think we can go ahead and get started if that's okay with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, good evening. My name is Evelyn Licona. I'm from um, South Carolina. I'm located in South Carolina, as I mentioned before. I am the Region 3 Women in Engineering Coordinator, and I'm excited to have here today uh, Professor Lunardi. She is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the North Carolina State University, and she uh, will uh, have a talk about her career and some advice she has about mentoring and she also um, so we would I was introduced or or, or, or mentioned um, about this wonderful person in our region by um, our director Theresa um, because of uh, the book she had co-edited and I thought it was a great idea to have her um, speak to us on this webinar as we are um, celebrating the uh, March 8th International Women's Day. I know this is a, a, a day with a lot of activity worldwide, uh, but I wanted to focus on the good things about what women have been able to do and overcome through the years. And as an example, we have Professor Lunardi. So um, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you for being here with us. Oh, thank you very much. For me, it's an honor to talk at home because usually I, you know, I just came back from Saudi Arabia when I was giving a talk like this. And for me, talking home is even, you know, it's even an honor. And uh, what I would like actually to, uh -oh. can I, oh, hang on, let's see if I can move. Yeah, I can move. So, first, Evelyn, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk because giving the talk home is even, you know, it's an honor because I know some of my colleagues are online. But first of all, I would, before I'm going to thank because all my career, uh, it's, it's because I had graduate students, undergraduates, postdocs, visitors, my collaborators all my life. It's because my colleagues, my managers, my teachers, that's why they collaborate, you know, and they gave me what I am today. And my friends supported me all my life since I was a student, you know. It's my friends, my colleagues that have given me the support I needed to go throughout the phase. And finally, I have also to 
thank my family for their unconditional love and support. My husband, my children, because they are the ones that have been supporting me and going through all the phases that I have. And I would like to congratulate all of you that are in the field of science and engineers. If you are a student there, I really congratulate you, you know, for discovering like I did, you know, the, you know, you're already there. I was always fascinated by sciences since I was a child. You know, there was no role model in my family. And I'm going to tell you about something. And, uh, you know, I try to tell people that, you know, I am always fascinated, motivated, and try to motivate people about science and engineer. I, you know, I am always marveled by, you know, every time I read a paper in science or engineer, I am, for me, it's fascinating and I'll be there. Uh, you know, for me, it's like, that's what I like and I do in life. So, congratulations. You are in what it is joy of living science and engineering. So, let me talk a little bit about myself since you are going to have to hear a little bit about me. So, I grew up in Brazil. Brazil, if you don't you know, it's the 50th largest country in the world in area in South America. I come from a family of immigrants. You know, I am the first uh, generation of going to college and actually I am the first generation of going to graduate school. My father was an accountant. My, fa my mother didn't go more than 50 grade. And, uh, you know, coming from a family that uh, escaped famine in Europe, they, you know, they valued, uh, you know, education. So they really pushed us to be educated and go well in school. And when I, you know, I always valued uh, when I was marveled by science and I went to actually study physics because one of the, my high school teachers, he just, I was, you know, I, it was the hardest subject I had in my life, but I loved physics. But it didn't have in my hometown. I could have a, a very predictable life, going to a small college, teach math, and grow up and have a large family, but I rebelled against having a predictable life. In my in Brazil, we have to go to admission, to go to go to big universities, and I rebelled to have a predictable life. But I decided to attend a large university, go through admission exam, and I attended one of the largest, and actually is one of the best universities in the world. That's the largest university in Brazil, and I had to commute every day because we were not allowed to live outside of the house. But I did it, and when I start attending physics. I was lucky enough that one of the teachers actually in, in, in one of the classes asked if anyone was interested in start undergraduate research and I was bold enough to start. Why not? I have to support myself. Why not? So I started doing undergraduate research was I was just a rising sophomore. So I was involved in undergraduate research all my life when I was an undergraduate. And it's interesting because a few years ago at NEC State, I visited the agency that was supporting me and they were amazed that I, you know, I came a long way. And, and it's interesting because when I was undergraduate, I worked with very large teams of physicists. But I was not happy. I had inside me something that he didn't tell me that I should be a physicist. So I, when I was writing my, finishing my uh, physics masters, because we were uh, supposed to write master thesis, I decided that that was not inside me. So I, I told my my sup, uh, my thesis advisor that I wanted to stop and she was really upset at me because she said, how come, you know, you have all the experimental data, you almost finish your classes. And I told her, no, I have to stop it because this is not what I wanted to be. So I started teaching in a small college of engineering, a, a private one. And I, I decided that that was the best step I had because my life at that time was changing very, I had other issues happening. And I start interact with electrical engineers and that small college actually wanted to support me for a Fulbright fellowship. 
and I passed and I won a Fulbright Fellowship and we came up with a project and we applied for the, uh, uh, you know, for programs in the US with a Fulbright Fellowship. It didn't come true because somehow it didn't go through, but I was lucky enough to get a support for another fellowship and I was accepted at Cornell and I came to Cornell and it was bold it was a bold move but i can tell you that it was very hard because i remember the phase that for me was very hard i read moving to a, a large university when i left my hometown and then i was moving to cornell that was you know i had a lot a lot of you know i arrived in the middle of the winter so there were a lot of things that i really had to have this transformation but i learned something getting out of my comfort zone and to challenge myself i discovered my true potential and that's what i actually like to instill in my students because i really think that sometimes when we challenge ourselves we discover the true potential that we have inside ourselves and i remember that for me it was very hard not that i didn't cry some nights and i decided to pack and go back to brazil but my pride wouldn't let me do that because i was so proud and i would always say what i'm going to tell my family that i'm not you know i am not strong enough so i came up and i said okay i am going to do it because i have a fellowship i'm not going to do it so that's what i i i, I tried myself to take classes to overcome whatever was the difficult in having an electrical engineering degree. And what and I found out that actually having a physics degree is much more difficult than an electrical engineer. So I took a lot of undergraduate classes in electrical engineering and I, I, was, I, I actually learned more than I should and I like it a lot. So this is my ad, academic mentor. I mean, took me a while to ask Professor Lester Isma because Big E, he was physically big, but he had a generous heart as big as him. This is one of my pictures because I was visiting him when we had the nanofabrication uh, anniversary. I was working at the National Science Foundation and we took a picture together because this man, he was not just generous, but he had his you know, it took me a while to ask him to be my advisor because some of my colleagues would say he has such a big group that he's not going to give you attention. But he gave me attention because he was the one that actually, he had a group that looked like the United Nations. 50% of his students were international, 20% were women. And you wouldn't think that, you know, you would have as many women working in a group like him. And he was generous enough that he would give advice. You would just have to fit in his schedule because he was very busy. He traveled a lot. And I wish he was not my mentor. That's what was the reason, you know, I never had a mentor. He was my advisor. I wish I had written a list of questions that I had, I never dared to ask him because he would answer my question, but I never dared to ask some questions. Even when I came back to visit him at Cornell years later, or when we met at conference, I wish I had asked him some feedback, some feedback that w were not when he was investing in my career, because what he wanted from me was to graduate, to have results because he had to, you know, to get grants from my results. He had to invest in other students. So I wish I had kept a list that we would compare at the time I graduate and compare what I had achieved of so many years later. Because this is what, you know, sometimes there is a difference when you have a mentor and when you have goals that are not when your mentor has some mistake on your achievement. And I'm going to talk more a little bit about this. So let me talk a little bit about my career because, you know, I, I span on, on several. So when I was time to graduate, Dr. 
And Professor Istam asked me, where do you want to work? I said, I don't want to work in academia. So he introduced me to a lot of uh, industry uh, relations that he had. So I went to work actually for Bell Labs because at that time they were, you know, giving me opportunity, not of having a green card, but also because they were giving me some opportunity in research that none of the other companies that I interviewed or offering. First of all, I was going to develop some things that I never learned before. I was going to be the first one to apply what I had from my PhD that was, I had the first thesis in the US on uh, heterojunction bipolar uh, transistor, gallium arsenide base, but I did in my grave and they wanted me to apply these skills for optical communication. So it was a different skill set, but also I was the only one on the group that I was going to work because they were in field effect transistors. So I was the only one that was going to apply these skills for optical communications. And I was going to uh, learn a lot how optical communications, because they were competing with Japanese companies at the time. NTT was the company that it, we were the main competitors. They had an Air Force contract that used these transistors for their own strategic uh, uh, you know, all, all strategic projects. So for me, it was very interesting to actually uh, participate on these projects that nobody were doing. So for me, it was very interesting to at the start that I was the one going to lead this group of engineers that they didn't know anything about my, you know, my own uh, the, uh, transistor, and we were going to, you know, participating on all the projects that they were strategic for at and Well, it was happened that few years later, we had, you know, a, a different focus for this technology because they prefer not getting worse night, but they want to do in the phosphide. So what happened is that I moved to another group that had the same technology that was HBTs, but they were using for photo receivers. And for me, it was much more fulfilling because in this case, I was working photo receivers that I never worked before. It was a different area because I, we were using for data links, but we were also using for optical communication. And in this case, it was much more rewarding for me. First of all, it was a different uh, management because they were much more proactive for my efforts. And the second, I was working with a submarine system that at and was very, very strong at that time. And we were actually proving that these devices, they had a much lower noise than the field effect transistors. And it was interesting because at that time, we were actually breaking world records. And I was recognized, actually, I got my fellow, IEEE fellow grade for this work that I did at this time at at and And it was very, very interesting because I never thought in my whole life that I would achieve this kind of recognition because I was so interested in the technical part and I was recognized for the, you know, research that we were doing that actually was very applied to communications. And then what happened when you are having fun, something, you know, falls down. at and broke in three companies. And for us, it was like a shock because we were attending an international conference in Europe and all of us found out that the company was going to break down and we were going to be maybe without the jobs. And I remember we, we went to my director and said, what's happening? And he said, I don't know because this is news to me. So when we came back home, we found out that our laboratory actually was so strategic for at and that was going to be replicated for Lucent Technologies and at and And I was lucky enough that I could choose which company I could stay. But in this case, I decided to go to at and because my husband actually was not lucky enough and it's a two body problem. You know, sometimes in life, that's what happens. So my husband was going to stay with Lucent. So we decided that maybe we had to, since it was a toss up, I was lucky enough that I could stay, go to with at and So in this case, for me, I thought it was actually learning new skills and we were going to be on the side of the business of at and that was broadband access. And for me, it was 
fine because I was going still to learn new skills. And I stayed with broadband because in this case, we were, there was a new, new uh, investigators and they were doing optical memes. And I never worked with optical memes. We had a foundry that was processing. So for me, it's very nice. And actually at that time, I didn't mind at all because this was pure research. But then what happened is that there was a lot of, you know, replication of work and i felt that i still wanted to do some hardware i still wanted to do lab work and i was invited to join jds uniphase that at the time it was a humongous company half of the headquarters was in canada in ottawa and half was in san jose in silicon valley so i was the first employee that was hired for jds uniphase in new jersey to start this new group that was called Optical Network Research to build a showcase for 40 gigabit at that time it was a very and but it was going to be division multiplexing to do all the testing for the optical components for JDS. So for me it was like I don't want to do manager but I would like to have really a research group that we start investigate all the optical different components because I never worked with it this. But then after a few you know, few years, the market was saturated and some of the companies is, is started shedding because they had more capacity in the fiber, optical fiber than they were producing. And JDS started transferring a lot of the publication to China. So I decided that before all my, uh, all my technicians, some of them, I started transferring to other companies and I decided at, that I was one of them that could find a job. And at this time, actually, in the last year that I was at JDS, something came up. And that's what is interesting because every time that something came up, I decided to take the different road. I was invited to be an expert to review for one of the DARPA projects. I talked to my CTO at that time and I told him, look, they would like me just to be an expert to review. I don't, I'm not going to make any money. You talk to DARPA and see, I don't want to make any money, but you talk to them while I am still working to JDS. If I can review the project, because it's very interesting, it's related to the work that I was doing at at and in new phosphide BJTs, and he said, yeah, I'll talk to them. So in the last year that I was, was working at uh, JDS, I was an expert to review for this. It was, you know, it was for, uh, uh, it was a, a very fast technology that it involved some companies and involved some universe. I still cannot talk too much about them because I still have this known disclosure agreement. So this was interesting because while JDS was in this turmoil and I was considering leaving and I left, I was interviewed, you know, I was an expert and then I was offered the summer you know, some of my uh, colleagues at academia, they start asking me, or would you be interested in interviewing for university because we would like to hire someone like you? So that's when, when opportunities up, showed up. So, you know, that's what I call serendipity because they lead you to new pets. And then, of course, I was away from home. Sometimes I would be traveling and I started to reconsider what, what would be the opportunities that would it take. So I started interviewing very few selected universities and one of them was NEC State. I love the place, warm like Brazil and a very large college of engineering. And I always thought to go back to academia when I was in industry, because I said, why not have this wonderful university environment that you have students? It was not in my immediate plans, but I was offered a tenured faculty position. Because of my qualifications, they offered me a tenure. And I said, why not? Because actually in some universities, they offered me more than tenure. And it was very interesting. And I was like, yes, I don't want to go for administration, but I would like to return to academia. So I took I, I, I took a chance to be part of the Wolf Pack. And uh, that's what I have been. I I you know, I, I am a professor at the uh, 
College of Engineer at Tennessee State. And I start to work and there were quite few professors that they were in optical network and some of them were in the college, uh, you know, computer science department. And I started developing some of the building blocks, you know, for photo detectors in silicon, some of transparent electronics collaboration with some of the faculty. And I also, you know, have some, uh, uh, you know, research in this place. So something that I like to play with. My highlight is since I have been there, it is because I really, really enjoy to work with undergraduates. I am in principal investigator of some of the National Science Foundation grants for undergraduate research. I actually followed some of my uh, former colleagues that at Tennessee State that had a STEM undergraduate for under uh, underprivileged students that don't have the means to pay tuition, but they are they have been admitted to uh, the College of Sciences or College of Engineering, and over some you know for several years I have been uh, the faculty advisor for the IEEE student charter. And in the department, actually, we have been lucky enough that our college of engineering uh, dean, he has been giving enough funds for supporting the undergraduate research. And during this year, actually, I have been a team member for uh, NSF uh, engineering research centers, and I was lucky enough to be education director for the Freedom Systems Center, where we interact a lot of, with uh, students. And I like to be actually part of the university in governance, because we can change some of the things that happen at the university. I went back actually to be in, govern in the government for two more than two years, actually, I was offered the chance to be a program director for the National Science Foundation. So there was a time that, you know, someone, uh, they needed someone to be a program director at the electrical cyber communication system. And, and I took it because it was perfect fit at that time to see how the National Science Foundation works. And it was like fitting exactly on my skills and starting a new program. I love it because in this case, I worked in, in some cross division programs like the career program, mentoring some faculty, working with the undergraduate research programs and actually starting new programs in some of the divisions. So if I look back, on all the, my career path is ups and downs and is very interesting because if I had to map it, it would something like this, that you have ups and downs, you know, more important moments in my life, combination of balancing my career development, my personal life, you can see that my first child, I have a set of triplets that, you know, this balance because they were born right when I was moving from two locations. Some very happy moments that happened and you can see I put the telecom bust because that's when I was moving out of JDS and didn't know, but there were very, very moments and I would, what I intended to do today is some advice that I would give it to myself or not given to myself, but if I had seen this path before, what may be the advice that I would give to some young women or even some young professional that would have a similar technical career and what would need because, you know, we learn from things that we had, but we also learn from things that were missing. They were absent the time that we graduate. And that's the way I see. I see that I understand clearly a situation when we are not personally involved. And the way that I see is that I missed to have a really mentor. That's what I talk about mentoring because uh, sometimes it's not that I didn't have mentors, but sometimes, for instance, when we had our company to be split I had, you know, not that I didn't have a confidant. My manager was my confidant. Sometimes he gave me very good advice, but at that particular moment, he also had a stake on, on, on which advice to give to me because he also had to find a job. He also had to stake into that moment that we had, you know, we were split. He, we didn't know where we were going. I couldn't trust him. I wish I had a different mentor. I wish I had a different confidant.
And that's what I would like someone that was not personally involved in that situation. And that's what I would like to main, mention now that sometimes mentoring from different source can give you different perspectives. And this is what is very important to all of you. Because in the, in the way that we are living right now, it's very important that, that you seek this. And it's very important that the different stages of your career, even now, I am an old person, very old, and uh, comparing to all of you that are here. But I think sometimes when the table is turned over, you, you should have consult because you know you can have mentors that belong to your community your church maybe but it is important that they give you different perspectives because it's up to you to make you know to have that those different options and opportunities to to have a guidance what is going to happen what is the importance of a mentor you choose someone that you admire that can be a mentor don't be shy to ask the worst that can happen is to have a no I received a lot of no's in my life, but it didn't stop me from going. You know, you, you have to keep it going because that's the way that you, you, you have that energy to keep it going because that's, you know, your technical area is very important because that's your career. Maybe you are going to change. You're not going to be technical anymore, but it's very important that there is some overlap. Maybe the mentor doesn't have to be in the same, but if you wanted to continue in engineering, maybe it has to have some overlap. And the different perspectives from you, it should be important because maybe has different stages of your career. It should be someone maybe that has over, you know, overcome some stages or not. You should consider that why it's so important to have that different stage to be considered. Just to give an idea about mentoring, I'm going to mention the way that, for instance, this is a picture that I have from one group of my scholars. I mentioned to you that I had a, a group of scholars and all of them were engineers. Some of them already graduated. If you start from one of them on the left, that is a mechanical engineer, then is a aerospace, then Olivia was a biochemistry, myself, then I have a civil engineer, computer scientist and another civil engineer. All of them, we used to get it together. And I had, these were just a subgroup of a, a, a cohort from other cohorts. But discuss, uh, discuss and present options on the maintenance career, because I could, I could discuss, present options to each one of them. I would let them grow, you know, Grow means that they would see the difference that they would have a semester to semester, decide on their own, their options. They would, I would have a different perspective from them on from each one of them and let them have opportunity from learning from each other, from, from each other and from myself, what were that to present, present themselves and discuss it. They would learn from themselves, they would learn from me, and they would learn from each, from themselves. And I think this is a process that mentoring allows people to grow. Personal growth, this is very important. And for me, I think when, as we, as professional, we needed to grow during our career, we always grow. I don't think anybody stays stagnant. I don't believe so because as humans, we always learn something. My grandfather, that was not very, you know, he always would tell me, you always grow something, you always learn something new, pay attention. And I would always, even now, I know that I, I learn something new every day. So learning new skills is part of your professional development. And you confront the changes every day. Not that you, 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 you are looking for changes. They happen to you. We have, you know, there are changes of management. You shift your career focus. There are life circumstances. I started having children. We decided to have a family. So these are life circumstances. We had a pandemic. These are life circumstances out of your control. And sometimes there is a break from the workforce. You wanted to have a different change. So there are a lot of, you know, involvement in your personal growth. And if you are going to change, you have to have some training. And one of the things that I would like to tell you about the training, 
it's how actually I incorporate in my own life, very early in my professional life, it was technical volunteer because your job does not define who you are. You have to extend your interests. You have to expand your network. You, you, when you expand your network, you make new friends. You meet all the friends. I'm showing you a picture of one of my friends because this person here, Professor Adesida, actually, when I was a graduate student, he was a postdoc at Cornell. And we, we used to work together in the clean room. And then he became a professor in Illinois. University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And we always kept meeting each other. And in IEEE, he was actually, we worked in the same technical society and we would always meet in technical conferences. And this is one thing that I always got involved with because I was, I have been a technical volunteer at IEEE since I was a student. And this is, it was a natural extension of my life. I am a technical volunteer for several things, but for IEEE, it was like a family for me because when I started, my professor would take us to IEEE conferences. I started attending IEEE conference. It was a flexible schedule to be a technical volunteer. I had the fun because I would meet uh, volunteers and this is you know expanded my network and i'm just going to give you an idea of all the you know all my volunteer activities i i today i i decided to do this laundry list but i can tell you that can be pages and pages because i have been a technical volunteer for IEEE for at least i am already a life fellow so you can imagine that it has been at least 35 years that i am there so you can see that not only through my technical society but for instance i was the women in engineer liaison for for my society and through that you know through that liaison i met the other liaisons from the other societies, we actually worked for the women in engineer. We decided that all the societies, technical societies and councils didn't have a uniform way that the women in engineer would be having, you know, connections. So we decided to have a best practice laundry list. And that was actually proposed to the technical activities board a few years ago. And we decided that it was the way that maybe that was a way to develop the promotion of women to be senior members, to start being promoted for activities, to, you know, fellow promotion, because I was actually working you know, I, I last, you know, two years ago, I was chair of the fellow committee. So this is the kind of things that you work, you know, and you, you, by volunteer, you can make a difference in governance in IEEE. You can make a difference and make life better for the students. And you can also make a life, you know, you reviewing publications, being an editor. I have been an editor in several publications part of editorial boards. Sometimes now with climate change, we would like to make sure that we are affecting the policies that govern the governance. You know, all of us are very worried what is going to happen for the next generation. So what I would like to suggest is that you can participate, you know, locally, region three. I participate in a lot of activities in Region 3, so it's very important that you get involved on these activities. So my final, my final note is to you is the following. Have an open mind instead of saying, if someone is invite you to participate in an event, give it a try because you're going to see that you meet new people. You make new friends. Those expenses and whatever happened may enrich your life, may open your network. Give it a try, think it over. Thank you, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you, this was a wonderful presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, please, um, you can unmute yourself or just put them on the chat. I will read them out loud. Um, in the meantime, I didn't check the chat. I don't see anything right now, but in the meantime, I do have a question. 
um, you were talking about boldness. So I was wondering where or like, how do you find that boldness? Sometimes uh, I know myself, uh, I, I might not be as confident. So I, I was just wondering, how do you get to be bold? How do you find that confidence? I think we lost him. Are you still there? Yes. I'm sorry. It looks like that I lost the connection a few minutes. Yes. I, I was just asking you a question of how do you find uh, the boldness and confidence to overcome all these challenges you went through? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm losing the connection. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, uh, I have a question for you. I was just wondering where you find the boldness and confidence to overcome the challenges or different, um, let's say, harder um, decisions you had to make. I don't know. I think um, I took, uh, uh, you know, I had my grand, my maternal grandmother as uh, one of, the, uh, you know, she. I think she's the one that gave me this uh, energy to do that. <laughs> she, I, I'm just going to tell you that she grew up in a farm and she couldn't go to school and she, dis, she was illiterate and she learned to read and write when her oldest grandson went to school. And uh, the first thing she did when she learned to write and read, it was to take her driver's license. And for me, it was always fascinated that someone could do that. And I think uh, she inspired me to fight. And I think that's what um, I always think, uh, you know, every time, every time I thought that I would give up and uh, she, she, she was the one that said bye bye to me when I came to us. And I think uh, she was the one that inspired me. I would talk to her on the phone every time from us. She never, you know, I never saw her after I can, you know, after I, I, you know, for a few years, I didn't see her, but she always would inspire me because she, every time I thought to give up, I would think of her. And I think that's what it is. We always have to have someone that inspires. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, now, thinking about what other people saw in you and decided to, for example, give you that grant or that fellowship, what do you think is something that people say, oh, I, I, I trust this person or uh, I want to work with this person or I want this person to work with us. I think you have always to be honest. I think you, you know, you have to know li your limitations. I, 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 I actually didn't know how much I knew. I always was very open to say what I don't know. And I think that's what I, you know, I, even my professor at Cornell, I always told him, I was very honest to him. I would say, just uh, give me a chance and I'll try to do my best. And I think you have to be open to people when you don't know, you don't know. I remember that one of my uh, smartest professors that he came back to Brazil. He, he had a PhD from MIT. And he always would say, sometimes you would ask him a question. He would say, I don't know. And I, I thought it was smart because he, he always asked, he always was asked things that he always answered. I don't know. And he, I was impressed because others would say something. And he, most of the times he would say, I don't know. I have to look because I don't know. So it was interesting that you, and he was the smartest of them, you know, so I thought it was interesting. So I always observed him, you know, and I was TA of him once and I was scared to death, you know, but I, I think people, it's like children, they imitate you. And I, because I didn't have a role model, so I always was imitating my professors. I would watch him and, and watch them. And always say, okay, if this is a smart person and does this kind of thing, why, you know, maybe he's a smart, you know, you know, I don't know. I didn't have scientists in my family or, you know, to, to understand what, how they behave. So I always, always yeah. watching people. Yeah. 
That's 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 good. I, I think uh, being open, like you said, being honest and being able to be curious about what other people have to say, uh, it's important to help us grow. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you have any um, advice that you would give any girls or boys that are interested in pursuing engineering. I think it's the most fascinating field that you can have because actually for women, I think engineering is a very, very liberating profession because you, you don't have to have a graduate degree. You can work as a professional engineer. You know, I think it's a mistake, you know, some other professions like Biology, you have to have a graduate degree because it's very limiting right now. You have to have a graduate degree to, to work in biology. But engineer, you can be a professional engineer and you can you work in teams and you can work, uh, you know, you, you can work in industry, you, you can work uh, in, in government. There are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of opportunities uh, to work as an engineer. And uh, I, I really think that uh, it, it's, I, I, I tell some of my students that they are in the right track uh, working as engineers. I, conv you know, I actually, some of the students that were going for sale as engineer, they came back and they did a master's to work in a better position. Okay. Yep. Um, now a question that we have for people that are already, um, I guess, they finished their degree um, and is asking, have you had a time when your career has faltered or hit or hit a setback? If so, how did you get past it? So you mean that when you hit a, uh, when you a hit uh, and you think that you don't have a way to recover? That's what it is. Maybe. Yes, or you're feeling like you're stumbling, I guess, and you're not sure if you should continue this path or change I, to something co to totally different. I think that's when you need to talk to people because, uh, you know, it, that's what you need to retrain yourself or take, you know, uh, evaluate how much do you know? Because nowadays, you know, uh, an engineer has a toolbox. That's what you, you gain when you go to school. You start creating this toolbox of your skills and you have to know how to manage this toolbox. And I think, it, I really believe that this toolbox is actually is never empty. You just have to rearrange it. So if you are, you know, if you are a hardware person or if you're a software person, it's just to rearrange this toolbox and retrain yourself. I don't believe that an engineer just stumbles and doesn't have anything to do. I really think that you have to be retrained and learn a new, you know, learning how to use that toolbox that you have acquired before and how to use again. I really think that. If you have the fundamentals there. You have the fundamentals there because yeah. engineer, you know, you have the fundamentals there. I think it aligns with um, one of your quotes about being open to the opportunities and the challenges, uh, challenging yourself and being able to um, discover your new potential. I think. And, and I triple E actually offers a lot of that. If you're an electrical computer engineer, I triple E offers a lot of that. Because some of the some of the technical conferences and meetings they offer a lot of, uh, you know, courses and workshops for that. Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. I know. I see uh, Rowan Osman with um, a raised hand. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for hosting, and thank you, Doctor. I don't want to mispronounce your last name, Len uh, Lenardi. Lunardi. It's an Italian name, like a solar lunar. Yeah, we are lunatics. Oh, okay. okay, it's a beautiful <laughs> name. We are not lunatics. It's just the same <laughs> way. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I definitely uh, like appreciate your time and like sharing uh, kind of that advice and inspiration. So I had two questions. Um, one was, I, I guess for context, I should say first that I, oh, sorry. Sorry. Bad timing. Um, my first, for context, I just recently graduated um, studying electrical engineering from the University of Virginia, and I'm starting my. I just started my first job in industry a few months ago, 
And so I feel very um, unsure about how to plan, how to, like, I, I feel like I have, I feel a lot of those initial career kind of hesitations of, did I make the right choice? How do I know, like, what is going to be ahead of me? So I guess I'm just wondering, like, how did you plan for your career? Did, did you plan or did you feel like you just let things happen along um, kind of unexpectedly? Um, and how did you balance, like, following your heart versus feeling like you needed to build experience and maybe making some sacrifices around that? That was my first question. So you want me to answer? Yeah. So I think, first of all, my professor actually had a very good, uh, you know, when you get your first job, if you, you were allowed to change it in the first six months to first year, because he said, you know, he, he told us maybe, you know, you have it a honeymoon and then when it's over, it's not what you want. So he said, you have to change fast because, uh, you know, it happens. And this was a long time ago that he said, he said, look, but you don't change as often as you think, otherwise you're not going to be, you're not going to be credible anymore. And when you are in your job, you have to talk to your supervisor. You, you have engineers always have a supervisor and engineers always supervise other people. If you don't supervise someone, something is wrong because you are, you know, that's the way that it works because engineers work in teams. So you should talk to the person that hired you and you have to have a career plan. What do they expect from you? If they don't expect from you anything in six months, something is wrong. I, when I went to Bell Labs, the nice thing about Bell Labs, it was a very shallow structure. In two levels, you were with the VP and that was scary. You know who was the VP in research? It was a Nobel Prize and he had a very mean, he was mean. He could either like you, he was digital, you know, either he liked you or he didn't like you. So you would be away from his pack, you know, because if he, because he could fire people in the moment. So you would try to work and be away from his pack because, you know, because it was only two levels of management. It was, you know, you would unlimited fund. You know, they would give you unlimited fund, but if you didn't do something that he didn't like, he would go to you. Sometimes he would be seated in your office when you came in the morning. So it was a scary. It was really scary. So, but it was okay. So you have to have a career plan and you, your immediate manager has to take care of you. If he doesn't take care of you, you're in trouble and you're in a bad place. Because this is the person that hired you. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's the real life. It is. Thank you. That's very helpful context. And I will think more about that when I can go back. <laughs> no, <laughs> and that's important to know because in industry, in academia, it's a little different, but in industry, I can tell you, I had, I had bad managers and, I, you know, I had to, sometimes I had to move, you know. And I can tell you one to one. I cannot tell you on something that is being recorded, but they are, you know, you have to, to look for yourself. That's why it's important to actually talk to other people because they can tell you. In industry, you can talk to other people. Don't involve the HR because that is useless. Um, thank you. And um, my second question was, Evelyn, yeah. just deleted this from the recording. <laughs> um, I, so you had also talked about, about like your, uh, I guess the influence of like personal circumstances, of family, of like your children. And so I guess I was just wondering how, if you could talk more about how you balance the influence of a family and personal circumstances with like saving your career. Because I think a lot of people in my generation in particular, like when I talk to my other friends who are women in STEM, often have the mindset of like, oh, I'm just not going to get married or I'm not going to have kids because I I guess it's um maybe just more of what we've been surrounded with growing up of that idea of how to be an independent woman or to save your career means making other completely making other sacrifices. But I feel like there must be a, a better balance. So I just wanted to know about your input on that. Well I think uh... I, you know, I have to tell you the first group that I work 
actually I was the I was the only one that uh, let me see the one with PhD that was married and start having children. The other one that was married didn't have children and didn't have a PhD, and the one that had a PhD didn't, was not married. So it makes a big difference, but the time it has changed and it shouldn't be on the, nobody has anything to do. See what happens in academia. Now we have a, a parental leave that either parent can take one year of, uh, you know, or sabbatical for taking care of children. So I think it has changed, has changed a lot. You know, you will stop the clock for tenure for to taking care of children, you know, uh, and I think it has changed a lot and it shouldn't be in the conversation. It has nothing to do in the conversation. This shouldn't be in the conversation. It's, it's just what happens is that in the US, they don't have, you know, the family is not a part of the conversation, but most of the companies are very, uh, you know, family friendly because this shouldn't be in the conversation. It should not, it should be not in the conversation. That's why you have to talk to, you know, you should not talk. This is, this is private and should not be in the conversation. I don't think so. It should not be even, you know, I had graduate students that were married. I had a graduate student that had children and, uh, you know, I understand very well. And uh, I don't think it should be in the conversation. How did they uh, manage or not? It, it doesn't matter because I, I respect very much one of my most productive uh, graduate students, PhD student that became in my postdoc had uh, two children. And I don't think, I think I understand very well the, how hard it is to actually to have children and ha being a, a graduate student is worse than working any place because you're limited by income. You cannot work as many hours as the others. You know, it's very hard actually. You have it. You have it to put the priority. Well, I think that's what it is. You make priority in your life. And you know, I think uh, if I can add something, it's a, it's it's something that um, has been um, a challenge. And hopefully, as more people are aware, there's more women trying to be out and working, and all these things are changing. So there's. Like you said, parental leave for both mom or dad, and 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 things are changing. It's not I want either a career or a family. I can have both, as long as I have a supportive family that's going to understand um, when you have to work on and things like that. Um, so um, I, I agree with what you're saying. It, it it there's there's some work that's been done, but there's still a lot a, a long way to go, um, and 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 hopefully. Like you're saying, it's not part of the conversation. It's just normal part of life. So yeah, it's not a, for your question. I think that's what uh, I think it's part of the conversation. Unfortunately, we don't have enough laws that uh, protect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's part of the conversation. It has improved over the years. Some of the companies is still keep your job, and uh, you know, yeah. yeah. And um, if you still have time, I have a, a, another question. Yes, um, yes. Um, what do you think are very important engineering um, social skills for engineers, um, either if you're in academia <laughs> or um, or outside in the industry? I think uh, I think it's interesting because when you're in an academia, actually, you you have to be like a, a small company. You have to do everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. I think it's it's very demanding to be in academia. I think it's very bad for women in academia because you have to do everything. You know, it's it's I think it's very demanding actually for if you don't have a tenure. I I I know a lot of uh, you know, I I talk to a lot of young uh faculty that uh, women that you know they they feel demand that they cannot start a family because they they don't have tenure and if both of them or uh you know both of them don't have tenure they are faculty they 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 don't have time for themselves because they have to write grants they have to teach they have students unless they are in the same field, and uh, I I think it's very unfortunate. In industry, you have vacation, you know, you have the time to take a vacation, 
the projects are more defined. You don't have to go so much for funding because mm -hmm. sometimes it's more structured. I really think that in, in academia, uh, you know, and now we have a lot of mental issues with uh, mm -hmm. both sides of the faculty and the students. So it has been a lot of uh, uh, stress that we didn't have as much before. And I think it's not a relaxed environment like it looks like from the outside. Because, uh, you know, in some sponsor, the research that you have in industry is a little more flexible because the projects are larger, you can distribute more the work and you don't have, a, you have more time to do the work. I think that's the difference that you, I can see. You know, I had, a, I, you know, when I had the small children, I would work in flexible hours and actually I put my kids to sleep and go back to lab. Mm. So it it was crazy. It was crazy because sometimes I would you know go to put them to work to sleep at eight o'clock, go back to work and they, you know work until midnight or something, because it was you know very flexible but crazy. But I don't know. It's I don't think that uh, it, it was because I had this choice. It was hard just to travel, but mm. you know, crazy. But I don't you know universities the same thing. But the funding. It's very demanding because you have to bring the money, and I think that's what is demanding. Okay, yeah. I can put a list side by side to you how hard it is, and yeah. I think the skills is always people skills. How you relate with your colleagues, yeah, people skills is always the issue that you have. You have to have a good group. Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any questions. You can unmute yourself or raise your hand. Or put them on the chat. Um, I appreciate this opportunity because this has been wonderful. I wish we could, you know, but we we have a very geographical distributed uh, region three, yes. and uh, you know, if you wanted to contact me, just email me, and I appreciate the opportunity. I really like to talk to all of you and uh, for the women. Keep it going because we have increased the number of women that are in engineering and I really appreciate that. Keep it doing it because, uh, you know, I hope we increase the number of women in engineer. Don't lose hope. It's a wonderful profession. Alan, you can go ahead and, and speak. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hey, so sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, I had a question. Um, I'm five years in now to, uh, after my uh, bachelor's degree. I um, went back for my master's and I graduated in May, but my master's is in uh, computer science with a focus on AI. And, you know, I, I, I heard your story and then I, I can reflect, you know, take advantage of all the opportunities that I have, you know, learn more, you know, spread, spread your wings and fly. But in the reality of things, it's like, I'm a five years, I'm five years controls engineer, right? That means that when I try to go into like a, I guess, entry level data science type position, they're offering a salary that doesn't represent what I should get. Um, so moving forward, how do you deal with these type of situations? I mean, it, does it boil back down to like, as long as I get an opportunity, then let's see what happens or based on your experiences and how should I move forward? Um, by the way, uh, boom, noche. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I don't know what to tell you about salaries, you know, because, um, yeah. I I think, uh, yeah, I don't know about salaries because I don't, you know, we, you know, I think what you have to consider is what are the opportunities that you are going to have, you know? Yeah, because uh, I don't, I, I, I cannot tell you about salaries. Yeah, I cannot tell you because I am out of date with uh, whatever is paying there. Yeah, yeah, I don't, you know, I think what you should, uh, yeah, I think what you should do is to, uh, you know, participate more in events that you talk to more people that are in the same situation as you, because then you can compare with them. 
you have to meet uh, more people. Yeah, you have to meet more people that are like you. Right, right. Have more of a control. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because it, uh, thanks for the input. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, because it just uh, trying to find a situation that you can, you know, to see. I think you have it to. That's what I encourage people to technical volunteer because then you talk to people and you know uh, they know. You know, you can trade information that is not, um, you know, it's not, uh, you're not applying for a job, but you can say what you know, what, what is the issue there. Because if you're just applying for a, a position, it goes through HR and, uh, you know, HR is, I'm not going to say anything about HR. Because <laughs> <laughs> I about the book too much. No, what happens is it's a little different because I can see what, uh, some students come back from the career fair and they always tell me, oh, because HR did this. And uh, I don't you know because HR is, you know, it's, they have rules for things, you know. Right. That's what exactly. I mean. That's what I meant that don't take that out from the tape, you know. Okay. Because I think what you should do, participate more where you can meet people that have the same background as you. I think that's what I would suggest. And, and then that will kind of open up more pathways that's more undefined yeah. and something you can't really yeah. look at, something you can just can't Google or research and like, hey, here it is, you know. Yeah, because it's sometimes, you know, it's not what is, you have as, you know, as work experience, but really what you know and how you relate and what you, you know, that's what it is. I think that's what is important, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And my follow-up question would be, um, currently, so, you know, I'm, I'm about to graduate this May, right? Um, and I've been looking for other positions. There's a role that came up to me where it's kind of a blend of both, where it's like a developer position, controls position, software developer, but you can still, it's not what I want per se, but, you know, in my mind, it's like, it's something different, uh, something good to try, right? Just until, uh, say, at least I tried it. But but the biggest concern is 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 your your viewpoint and based on your experience. It may, this may be new, but uh, what what what's your input on double dipping? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's up to you. That's why you need to have a mentor to help you. Right. Yeah. Right. That's what mentoring coming apart. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank yep. you for your input. I appreciate it. Mentoring. That's what mentoring <laughs> is important. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any time of the career, mentoring is important. Find one or two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't see any other questions. I get my, my last um, question or request would be if you can just talk a little bit about your um the book you call it is it the woman in microelectronics what is oh, it about yes. You, yeah. yes actually it was very interesting because i was in a i went to a conference one of inter society of women engineers and i met uh jill Tilt, that she's the author and actually she's the editor of a series of uh you know on women in science and engineer she's a, a power electrical engineer and she invited me to edit a book on electrical engineer women. And then it passed and I told her, well, and she sent me several emails about, uh, and then I told her, okay, my area, maybe I'll do in micro, uh, microelectronics. So I, I had a proposal for a Springer. Uh, and uh, one day I received an email from Alice uh, Parker that I don't you know, I never met Alice. And Alice said, uh, uh, I like it, the title. And I was trying to have a book with uh, a title that looked like yours. I said, well, this is my title. And then we started talking. And I said, what about if we combine this? And I said, well, let's think about it. And then we saw that actually we had a lot of colleagues that we knew each other. So we said, we are going to combine this book. And we decided to combine because Alice actually is an aluminous from NEC state. So when I found out, I said, why not? You know, it's one of these, it's sitting deep, you know? So it's very interesting because we started just, uh, and she's from San Diego, 
uh, University of Southern California. And uh, I know some people there and it was very interesting because we have colleagues together and, and we never met. So it was very interesting that we just decided to co-edit and I want the, the title is mine, but we, we didn't know which order was. So we, we decided that Springer would, uh, they just decided, you know, they, they, by random, they decided which one was. So they decided which one and Alice was the first author, so, uh, editor, but it, it was, that's the happened. So we decided to show uh, the life is of several women that contributed for microelectronics. So we had one part that actually, or we decided to do the sequence from materials to devices to integration. And one of the women actually is the one that started uh, the founder for the Grace Hopper conference. That is a computer scientist. So there are several of them. And it was very interesting that we, we put all kinds, you know, they spun from there are several in US, there are seven in Europe, we have in Asia. So we, we, we tried to have a variety of women in all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fields. Some of them migrated, they started in materials and then they are in sensors. Some of them are industry, some of them started like me in industry and went to academia. So there are a lot of uh, variety. And it was very interesting just to read these stories. And yeah. I contributed with a charpenter and Alice contributed with a charpenter and we got the Dean of Berkeley, that is an engineer, an electrical engineer that wrote the preface. So it was very interesting. It sounds like a very uh, interesting, like you're saying, a very uh, challenging experience as well. Doing yeah, that. and it was <laughs> during the pandemic. So during yeah. the pandemic, we had something to do. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, I don't see any raised hands or any other questions, and I do greatly appreciate your time and, and all your advice on um, being bold and um, being open to opportunities and taking over the challenges and um, finding those people that are there to lead you in the path that um, that maybe you don't want, but they're 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 there to give you advice and you can take and and, and have an open mind. Um, um, I hope we can. Um, we we like you're saying we should have mentors and 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 then as we progress in our careers be mentors to others um coming um or interested in engineering um uh, i don't know if um anybody else any questions or comments but i just wanted to thank you i, I really appreciated your presentation and your time i i it was a pleasure and thank you for inviting me thank you very much it was very nice thank you very much and any of you that want to talk to me, just send me an email. I answer my emails in 24 hours. <laughs> uh, can you provide your email address? Um, if not, I can send it out. But um, oh yes, it is. It is in the. It is in the first one. I'll show you. It is here. It's my email address from NC State. Okay. Or Leda at ietripoi.org. My first name at ietripoi.org. One of them works. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, and have a good night. Thank you. Hey, take care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye now. Thank you.